I'm on the line with Lucas Big Daddy Brown. How are you doing today? Very good, mate. Thank you for your... Uh, yeah, it's a pleasure to have you here. Um, okay, so you're over in the UK for a fight you've got on uh, on Saturday. Um, but just before yep. just before we touch on that, I just want to go back a few steps in your career. Um, first of all, I want to touch on um, what it was like to fight uh, James Tony. Um, I believe you fought yep. him actually in Australia. Is that correct? That's correct. Yeah, uh, we fought in Melbourne, um, and at, at that point in my career, I was I was coming up, and he was going down, obviously. So I get a lot of flack from people saying, "Oh, it's not the James Tony of you know, his prime," which is fair, fair call because he was a you know, more middleweight rather than a heavyweight. But um, he's still a, a completely crafty and knowledgeable person. Um, and for me, coming up, it was a, a perfect way for me to sort of test myself against a very good caliber person. Um, and I won a, a WBF world title in that fight. So for me, it was a very good steps in the right direction. And like you say, a lot of people would give you slack for fighting someone like Tony at that stage in the career, saying he's, he's a washed version of, of, of his, um, you know, his prime. But what did yeah. you take from that? I think you'd only had about 15 fights or so when you went into that fight. What did you take from it? And do you have any sort yeah. of anecdotes or memories from the night, uh, that you, things that you might have shared with uh, James? Um, it was my first real sort of introduction to uh, the way that the Americans sort of go about fighting. Um, specifically, obviously, the, the press conference and weigh in when it's all a lot of talk and a lot of trash talk and things like that. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm a very quiet person when it comes to that sort of thing, and I, I just do my fighting in the ring, basically. I, I, I don't mix words prior or anything like that. Um, so it was my first indication of how sort of it would go against an American. Um, in saying that, he, he with the fight itself, uh, he was very talkative initially, and I think I broke his jaw during the fight, so the the, the talk did stop uh, during the fight, and I obviously knew he was hurt and uh, struggling at some point because he did stop talking. So it's when he stopped, you you realised that you'd you'd done something there to to sort of get him to be quiet. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, so um, I, I got through to the eleventh uh, round. And I thought to myself, I, I was basically in two minds. I knew I was winning the fight. So do I sort of cruise through the 11th and 12th, come through with a win and, and not just be safe? Or do I sort of press the action and, and see what happens? And, and I, I sort of, knowing who James Sony is, uh, knowing what he's been through and knowing what he's capable of, I didn't want to press it too much, knowing that I was in front and then like, obviously have a, a stoppage or something on, on my own part. So... Uh, I cruised through the 11th and 12th and just took the took the win and uh, was happy with that. Did you share any words or anything with him after the fight? Maybe in the change rooms or anything that you remember? No, actually, I didn't didn't see or talk to him um, after that. And as I said, he obviously had some an issue with his jaw, so he didn't talk to me at all. <laughs> yeah, not surprising if you broke his jaw. Um, so moving forward, <laughs> moving forward in your career, um, you've actually fought in the UK uh, quite a few times before you before you fought Dillian over here. I think maybe four or five times you'd been over here. That's right. Um, so I mean, yeah, I believe it's uh, six all up now. Yeah. Wow. And um, you, I think you just before you went out to fight Chagev, was it one or two fights you fought Redenko here, and you got the WBA Intercontinental title here. Um, I think you defended that defended that against uh, Chauncey Welliver, um, yep. Juli Julius Long, and then you went over to fight Ruslan Chagev in Chechnya. Um, yeah. When you knew you were going to go out to fight in Grozny, were you at all daunted by the fact? Because it's one of those places in the world where obviously they've been fighting for independence with the Russians for a long time, and it's a sort of scary place to go to for many people. Um, were you at all yeah, daunted by well, that? Truly. Um, I basically had two choices. I had to either just grin and bear it and, and just sort of go with it and see what happens. Or you could say no, obviously, but then you're giving up a chance to win a world title or fight for a world title. So from my point of view, to, to say no was, just wasn't an option. So um, it, was a, it was a hell yes and let's go and, and over I went. So 
and, and initially I was I was a bit daunted and you know, war torn country, things like that. But um once I actually got there, I was treated like an absolute movie star the entire time and, and can't say enough for the way that I was treated when I was over there. Fantastic. Um, so, you know, like in the build up to the fight, I assume you, you were the underdog there and, and, and nobody sort of expected you to go there, especially into, into Grozny and, and get the win. Um, did that motivate you more or did it, did it relieve some of the pressure off your shoulders that you might have felt otherwise if you were going there with everybody expecting you to, to you know, to, to deliver? Um, I, I quite like being the underdog because then less people are just expecting from you. Um, when you go into a fight and, and everyone expects you to fight, there's obviously, you know, there's, there's, there, there's that pressure for you to, to come through and, and, and go with the goods. When when you are the underdog, no one really expects much. So there's, there is less pressure to begin with. Um, I don't think I was ever there to win the fight, no matter what, whether it was decision or, or anything else. Um, and by the fact there wasn't a belt for me there on the night was also a big indication for that as well. So and you got knocked down, did you, in, in, in the fight? Did you get knocked down in the sixth round or something of that, of the Chagaya fight? Sixth round, yeah. Sixth round, and then yeah, um, that's right. you got back up, and I don't think anybody expected uh, you to do what you did to Chagaya there. Um, so it was. I remember no. um, a lot of, a lot of my, the, my friends and the guys on the podcast being shocked and, and thought, you know, what a stoppage sort of thing when it happened. Uh, in the immediate yeah. aftermath, um, sort of, was it a bit hectic and frantic in, in, in there? Or did you get anything untoward happen to you after that? Or was it, were you still treated like a movie star, as you said? Um, it, was a, it was a weird situation because in the sixth round when I got knocked down, um, the round went, uh, I believe it was 30 seconds longer. Um, and then the seventh round when I sort of got my wits about me, came back and I was coming back on top a little bit the round shortened by 45 seconds. So someone was playing with the uh, the timer there. Um, you know, in, in, in that round where I did actually knock him down and obviously finish the fight, um, I turned around, looked around at the crowd, thrown my hands up, said yes, and it was absolute silence. Um, it, there was my, my corner was going crazy, as you can imagine, and I actually told them to shut up because we were the only ones making noise in the entire venue. Um, but knowing that the president himself was, like, there watching and he's best friends with Shigeo, who I just beat, um, yeah, we, I just said shut up, and we sort of... We were just silent in the middle of the ring waiting for things to happen and let's get the hell out of there. So n nothing happened as such, but, like... The, the, the eeriness of the actual venue just really hit home. Have you ever been in a, in a situation that was uh, perhaps more frightening than that when you've been fighting? Um, no, no not, not really, no. No, I haven't. So moving on from, from Chagayev, um, you had uh, Matthew yep. Greer in Australia and then you came over to fight Dillian White uh, in March last year. Um yep. Is there anything, looking back on the Dillian White fight now, is there anything you regret about going into that fight or, or you know, um, sort of the way you prepared, anything like that? Yeah, in terms of preparation, um, I was I was in... My, my trainer at the time, Rodney Williams, was a, is, a, is still a great boxing trainer. Um, but I wasn't doing any of the strength and conditioning. I wasn't doing any of the other things apart from the boxing that I should have been. Yeah, in saying that, I've rectified all that, all those things since. Now, unfortunately, it, it sometimes takes a loss for you to, to learn, and um, a loss on the world stage, as I did get knocked out, etc., uh, wasn't the best way for me to learn, but I have learnt since. I have rectified the situation since, um, and I think that I'm in better condition than I've ever been for, for any of my fights. So um, I've always been fit. But and I was fit for that fight as well. But I, I definitely was not in any sort of condition, and I think it played on me mentally as well. Having a lot of time away from my family, uh, away on camp, all that sort of stuff it was like almost eight weeks away from my family. So I think that played a big part of it as well. Um, so the, the the conditioning side, but also the mental side. 
You've certainly been looking in, in great shape from the pictures of, I've seen on, on social media. What have you changed? Um, I know you've had two fights, two stoppages you've got since losing to Dillian, but what have you sort of changed in your camps um, since then? Well, exactly that with the strength and conditioning um, and also the, the new, new trainer. So my new trainer is in Perth where I live full time. So I'm no longer away for you know, four to eight weeks um, in camp. So I'm, I'm at home the entire time. Uh, I see my family every day, all that sort of stuff. So that's that's a big one for me mentally. Um, physically, uh, training better, training smarter, uh, you know, all the strength and conditioning stuff that I've just never done for any fight. So I'm finally doing it. Uh, I'm almost 40 years old, so I need to be in the best condition possible. And I think I'm finally getting it right. Um, unfortunately, it's a little bit late, or later, I should say. But um, I think I've all got it right now, so it's good. As you say, you're, you're nearly 40 now. Um, you've got Camille Sokolowski on, on Saturday. Um, in his last fight, Camille got got the upset against uh, Nick Webb, who'd um, just come off a loss to yep. to or um, just come off a loss to uh, Dave Allen, I think. And he was um, he might have had one fight yes. in between then. And he was, you know, uh, everybody assumed he'd get past Sokolowski. Uh, obviously, Sokolowski got that got that win. Um, are you aware of that? Are you yep. going in there knowing you know that he he, he can do that? Um, and what sort of where oh, do you yeah, see yourself going? Yeah. We, we, we always make sure we do a proper you know, research and everything uh, on who we are fighting. We, we picked Sokolowski ourselves. Um, I don't want an easy fight. Like one, one of the people I offered was uh, someone who was 0-2. So two fights, two losses. Now, for me, I, I, I have no idea why I would want to come over to Scotland and fight someone like that and you know, knock him over in the first round and then go home. I, I want to test myself, have a good fight, um, the he's had 14 losses, but he's only been stopped twice in those 14 losses. So, like, he's very well conditioned. He's got a great chin. He'll come forward and do good pressure. He's basically everything that I need in a good prep fight to go into my next one. So I, I'm very excited about it. He's definitely a better fighter than his record would suggest. And um, just go yeah. looking... I know no fighter wants to look past the next opponent, but looking past Saturday, you get past Sokolowski... Obviously, there was the talk of the Dave Allen fight. Is that still your goal um, going forward, to have that Dave Allen fight, or is, is there other things on the agenda now? Yes, 100%. Um, I've, got, I've, I've signed a contract, and the contract was for April 13, and that was when AJ was going to be fighting at Wembley, etc. Um, I've got confirmation today that it will now be April 20 um, at the O2 Arena. So it's still Dave Allen. Um, so 100%, as I said, I think Sokolowski is a perfect person for me to step up and, and obviously beat to lead into an Allen fight for me. So um, I'm, I'm extremely excited about where the career is going already this year. Um, I'm in the condition that I should be and, yeah, all, everything's falling into place the way it should. Last thing on, on your own personal career, like you said, you're nearly 40. Um how long do you see yourself going on for? And what's your sort of end goal now in terms of your career? Yeah, well, I, I did start extremely late. I basically started full-time boxing at 32 years old. So given the fact that um, I had a very inactive middle part with all the, um, the drugs issues, etc., cetera, um, I haven't had a lot of boxing uh, over the years. So... I had no amateurs. I've had. I haven't been beat around the head all these years. So, for me, I'm still relatively fresh in regards to boxing. Um, I believe I've got a good sort of five years left in me. I don't really want to be doing it after that. Um, so, it really does depend on how I how I go. If I start losing um, by say poise decisions, things like that, I'll continue. But if I start losing by proper knockouts or, or proper stoppages then I will have to have a look at it and see where I'm at. But um, I think for me at the moment, I've won the world title. Um, I really want to, need, I, I want to be able to get paid and be able to do something with it after boxing. That's pretty much where my head's at at the moment. So good competitive fights, get paid well. Um, for me, there's no money in Australia in boxing. Um, hence the reason I'm over here in UK. And I think... 
I'm very well accepted over in the UK, which is good. Um, but the money for me is obviously double with the pound. So uh, I'm extremely happy with the UK and, and coming over here and fighting. And we'll take it from there. Two more things you just mentioned there that I, I want you to touch on, actually. Um, you talked about getting knocked out and stopping if that happens. Do you think... Oh, you've had yeah. two fights since the white stoppage, and that was your first loss as a professional. Do you do you think that took anything out of you, or do you, do you feel any different after that fight? Or are you did you you know when you came backwards, did you feel even even more rejuvenated uh, with the different training you were doing? Um, I wouldn't say it took anything out of me. I think it um it was really the kick in the ass I needed, and I think when I first started boxing, um there's an element of sort of fear of getting hit. Now, I know I've got a good chin, I can take a hit, um, but you shouldn't sit there and get hit. I think during my career, I sort of beca I became very complacent, thinking I've got a good chin, I'll just get hit, it's fine, no problems. And, and obviously the, the longevity in that's no good. So I think with the white fight, it sort of made me revert a little bit back to when I first started and... The fear of getting hit is back into me a little bit more. So I think uh, what you'll see is me working on a better distance, uh, using my jab more. You know, I'm six foot five, so against someone like a Sokolowski who's six one, I should be using my jab more and my distance more, movement, etc. So I don't land shots. Uh, I don't. Sorry, I don't get shots landed on me. So I think. With the white, the way that I was beat with the KO with white, I think it was definitely the kick in the arse I needed. Um, and I think uh, it, it made me sort of look at what I was doing and I've made the changes since. The other thing we didn't mention as we moved through through some of the early stages in your career was um, the relationship with Ricky Hatton, what happened in the aftermath of the of the um, win in Chechnya. Um, just talk us through yeah. sort of uh, how everything went, um, you know, with the with the drugs test, and then uh, the breakdown of the relationship with Ricky, and, and sort of how you feel about that. Looking looking back on it now, um, the the getting with Ricky Hatton in the first place was awesome. Obviously, uh, opening up a lot of doors, uh, specifically UK, but just opening up a lot of doors with boxing in general. Um, I think it was a very good thing. Um, unfortunately, the, the three-year deal that I did sign ended up going to, uh, to seven years. Now, I think from my point of view, that was my issue, that I was sort of stuck in this contract that I didn't want to be stuck in. But thanks to legal people and um, yeah, through the drug test, getting, getting banned, etc., it was all extended, extended, extended. So um, having someone who's promoting you but across the other side of the world, it's quite hard and difficult. The communication wasn't exactly the best. Uh, Ricky was having issues with his own sort of team itself. And it may not have been Ricky's fault, a lot of these things, but at the same time, it's his name that's on, you know, on, on, on the door. So he, it comes down to him in the end. So um, I, I don't have a problem with Ricky himself. Uh, unfortunately, it's just sort of, it, it's ended the way it has ended, but um, I'm, I'm, I'm happy with where it's at. I'm, I'm, I'm happy that I did have the chance to work with Ricky, etc. Uh, but I'm definitely happy that it's over at the moment. Do you still get people on social media, etc., fans sort of um, having a go at you about the failed drugs test and what happened there? Not so much about the failed drug test, um, but I do get, I still get uh, messages daily from people who just want to abuse you for no reason. So, uh, unfortunately, I think the way that society is these days, there's a lot of access to anyone, really. So, you, you can say what you like. Um, none of these people would say it in person, of course, but uh, <laughs> that's just the way social media is and that's the way society is at the moment. So... I don't get too much about the drugs uh, side of things. I think people realise that uh, I was cleared. I now have uh, the belt at home and it's the legit WBA belt. So you can't really argue with that. I, I, I got done with something. Uh, I was wrongly accused. I got cleared and I have the belt. So there's not much else you can sort of say about it. Do you think... How frustrating was it when you got, you got cleared um, and... Do you think there's enough 
sort of checks and, and, and whatnot in place that can protect fighters when they, you know, when these sorts of things happen. Um, and what do you think should happen to people who have clearly failed and, and, and you know, have actually cheated the system? Yeah, well, um, unfortunately, the situation that was in with in Chechnya, etc. The, uh, the the president himself of the country was putting the show on and, and had everything to do with it all. So, not saying it was him or anything else, but you know, w yeah, it was just a, a bad situation for me to be in, and uh, it happened. When it, when it comes to someone like a, a Povetkin, who's has been done for steroids a few times now, yet comes straight back. Um, and obviously due to the money and the people that are around him, he fights for one or two regional titles and he's got a world title shot again. Um, I just don't understand how boxing works when it comes to that. You basically, it, money does talk and, and, and who you, who's in your corner definitely makes a big difference. Um, I think it's quite unfortunate for someone like myself who just doesn't have that massive money backing to be able to jump straight back into anything. Um, someone like Vivek can... It comes off those things and goes straight into war time. I, I, I don't think it's fair, but when it comes down to it, that's boxing. Money money runs the world, unfortunately. It certainly is unfortunate. Um, just moving away from your career now, um, current heavyweight scene, who do you see as number one in the heavyweight division right now? Uh, I think uh, Anthony Joshua is definitely number one. Uh, he's got all the belts. He's got all the notoriety. Uh, the money follows him, so I, I definitely say Anthony Joshua. What do you think of his matchup with um, Jarrell Miller? Is it the fight you wanted him to see for in next? Um, how do you see it going down? Uh, I, I wanted to see him fight uh, Wilder. Uh, obviously, him and Fury have ha ha had that fight, and, and things were going on, so uh, it didn't happen. But I think Jarrell Miller will be a good fight for him because it, it'll open up doors for him in America, being at, at, at uh, Madison Square Garden. Um, Gerald Miller is, you know, walks around or for, sorry, fights at like 140 kilos. Like, that's a big boy to try and push around. So I think it'll be a great test also for Joshua. Um, it'll show something else that he hasn't sort of shown or it will test him in a way that he hasn't been tested yet as well. So I think it's a, a, a good fight for Joshua. Um, Miller does get hit a lot or he allows himself to get hit a lot so Joshua just has to bide his time keep his distance and, and just pop, pop shots off uh, but again much like a Klitschko would have done anyway so I think Joshua is the new Klitschko Do you think though by taking a fight like Miller um, Joshua runs the risk of, sort of becoming the third wheel I know he's got all the belts and the money sorts of, sort of has followed him now but with the Wilder and Fury fight, obviously their their sort of uh, clout within the division raised even even higher. And do you think if they continue to, if they have that, it doesn't look like the rematch will happen now straight away, but if they go into more exciting yeah. fights with top opponents like, say, Joseph Parker or any of these other guys who are floating around the top of, of the division, do you think Joshua can end up being yeah. the third wheel in the division even though he's got three of the belts or four of the belts? To be honest, no. Um... From, from especially from a money point of view, like um, to fight Wilder for I can't remember the exact figure, something like I don't know four, four or five thousand, uh, four or five million, or then to fight Gerald Miller for thirty-two million. Like I know where I'd be going. So <laughs> I think it's definitely a smart fight for for AJ. It's a smart business decision. Um, I, I realise Fury has the name and everything else, but. I still think AJ holds it over both of them, no problems whatsoever, um, in terms of in, in everything, boxing skill, but also just the, of who he is and what he represents. I think definitely in terms of a business decision, Miller was the best fight to take. Someone like Luis Ortiz is probably too dangerous in terms of looking at it from a business perspective. Um, he poses probably a lot yeah. more problems than, than, than Miller would for Joshua's style. But like you say, with the, when you factor in the money, the opponent, um, all those sorts of things, Miller was the right opponent from a business perspective. But from a fan's perspective, um, you know, he got booed, I think, when he came into the ring or, or he tried to sort of... Um, yeah. Him and Dillian White had a spat uh, after Dillian White's fight with um, Chisora, I think it was. Um, so sort of the, yeah. there were signs that the fans were sort of, you know, getting a bit frustrated that he wasn't making the Wilder or the Fury fight. And I just wonder if, if, if you know... Um, 
those two are going to grab the, the limelight somewhat away from him. Um, that, that was sort of what I was alluding to there. Um, out of Wilder and Fury, um, did, did you watch that, that first fight that they had? Yes, of course, yeah. And um, what did you make of it? And what did you make of the result? Well, one thing that I, I get hammered um, by people from the UK in particular about this, but Wilder is the champ. And if you come into someone else's country, they are the champion. You must beat the champion. Now, I don't think Fury on the night beats the champion. So I am 100% behind the decision that was made. I do not think Fury won. Um, or I do not think that Fury beat the champion. And I was completely happy with the decision. When you say he didn't beat him, do you mean like from your perspective as a fighter, you know that if you're the away fighter, you have to go in there and not just um, win, but you have to win convincingly and do the go an extra mile than you would, you know, the, than if you were at yes. home, sort of thing. Is that is that what you mean? Yes, one hundred percent. Yeah. Um, so Fury Fury did that against uh, Klitschko. He went over to Klitschko's backyard and he he beat him properly. He, uh, he did everything he was supposed to do, and there was no question in anyone's mind that Fury won that. Um, and I just don't think he did that with Wilder. Would, it doesn't look like that fight's going to happen again, but if the, if the rematch does happen down the line, who, who would you be backing? Who do you think would win, win the rematch? <coughs> uh, personally, I'd be backing Wilder, um, just for the fact that you look at his career where he fought Stavern, he went the, the distance with Stavern, the only person that's taking him the distance. But then the next time he fought him, he absolutely dem demolished him. So for me, I think Wilder had it in his head that uh, obviously Fury is a very, very good opponent. Um, but when it comes to the fact that he, he knew that he won, he knew he knocked him down twice. I think the very next time they fight, I think Wilder comes out of the gates a little bit harder, and I think he actually knocks him down, knocks him out this time. Fantastic. It's been a pleasure speaking to you, Lucas. Um, if anyone wants to follow you on social media, what are your um, social media channels? Uh, I'm, I'm not on Twitter anymore. I've just given that up completely. So uh, <laughs> I'm on Facebook, uh, and I'm on uh, Instagram, both under Lucas Brown. Fantastic. Well, all the best on Saturday, and uh, hopefully I will catch you uh, in person in April against uh, to see you against Dave Miller. Dave Allen, sorry. <laughs> Excellent, mate. Thank you very much. I appreciate your time. It's been a pleasure speaking to you, Lucas.